Thank you, everybody. This is the first time we can kind of spread out a little bit, although this side is very heavy and that side's kind of sparser, but I'll move around as we go. So at least you can, I can see everybody and um, let me turn my microphone on. This microphone, sorry. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Okay, great. So wonderful to be with you. Um, my name is Bruce Momgen. I work for Enterprise DB. Live in Philadelphia. I'm really excited to be here for this Postgres event. Uh, we've, uh, over the past couple years, we've been able to increase the number of Postgres events on the East Coast, and I'm excited to have uh, a Postgres event here on the West Coast. And I think there'll be a lot more coming uh, as we go forward. I'm also excited to be at, at FOSS 4G. I'm not sure how many of you are here for the full four days, but I was here for the full. Uh, I was here yesterday, and I'll be here for the full four days. And I'm getting a lot out of it because, again, as somebody who works at the database level, to actually see how people are building stuff on top of it, how the tiles work, how the shape files work, how you pull JSON out and then you make little maps you can zoom in on and stuff, it's really super cool. So um, I would say I'm still kind of learning from it. Um, there was a nice presentation in, in uh, Chicago that I went to about PostGIS, and now I'm sort of immersing myself even more. So. Uh, I'm learning a lot, and I hope you'll learn something from this presentation as well. Um, this presentation is, is actually really popular um, because it really deals with a, a topic or an area of the system that's, that's kind of magic to me. Um, uh, I'll explain in a minute why, but, but this has always been like a really sort of important area um, for me to kind of understand what's happening inside of Postgres, and, and the goal here uh, is to really give you an understanding of what's happening inside of Postgres so you have a better idea of sort of how you can influence it. If Postgres isn't doing something you want, uh, you'll have an idea maybe a little bit better of exactly how to make it do what you want it to do. Uh, so normally this presentation is like longer than 35 minutes, so I'm going to actually present and then I'm going to ask, ask for questions. So if during the presentation you have a case where uh, you want to ask for questions? You can just remember your question for me. That would be really great. I'm just worried if I take questions that I actually won't be able to finish the slides, and that's like bad. So, um, so let, let's get started. Uh, this is an internal kind of presentation of what happens inside the Postgres query optimizer. Um, effectively, this is your user uh, up here, and this is your database over here. And effectively, you've got some application code running which is then calling some kind of interface library. It's sending the query over to the database, and the database is sending the result back. So it's kind of a traditional client-server kind of a, of a setup. Um, and pretty much all the databases work at this sort of level. Um, internally, what happens inside this box here? So, so that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this is a blow-up of, of kind of what happens in the box. Uh, up here you have the Postmaster and the Postgres backend, if any of you have dealt with that. And down here you have some helper functions. But we're going to kind of zoom in on this, uh, this uh, green area there. And, and that's effectively what happens with every query. When a query comes in, it's got to be parsed. It's got to be broken up into words. So we identify, is this a select statement? Is this an update statement? Is this a vacuum statement or create index or whatever? And then um, if it's an insert, update, delete, or select, we actually uh, send it down to something called the rewriter, handles things like views and, and um, rules. And then we send it into that, this thing called the optimizer, this sort of magic area uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, and then finally, once the optimizer has done its job, it goes to the executor. And then once it's done executing, it goes back up to parsing again. Okay. So this is uh, sort of the Postgres view of it, but pretty much all the relational databases follow this pattern where you're bringing stuff in, you're parsing it, you're, you're optimizing it, and then you're executing, and then you kind of go back to the beginning again. So the reason I we're talking about the optimizer today, because this is the area I think is most interesting. Um, when I was a, a database developer in the 90s, I used a lot of relational systems, Ingress and uh, Informix being the two primary ones. And uh, when you're working with a commercial database, I'm not sure how many of you have experience with this, but you send the query, and then you get the results back, and you send the query, and you get the results back. And sometimes the query doesn't come back very fast. Um, it's like, what happened? Like, this query looks just like this other query, and it's taking a lot longer. So then you, you start to dig into what is actually happening inside the system, 
And in pretty much every, all of relational systems, when you've got these bad, bad queries, the problem pretty much comes down to the optimizer. The optimizer for certain queries, which may look like other queries, certain queries, they just don't handle them well. And, and that's kind of why I got involved, because obviously I'm an application developer. I have no way, way of seeing the ingress source code. I have no way of seeing the uh, informic source code. But I'm like, why is it making this mistake? Why is it doing this? And in fact, how does, the, how does the database do this magic in the first place? How do I send a query and all of a sudden it knows I should be using this index and I should join these and I should do this kind of hash join and, and you're like, how does it do that? You know, it's not magic, obviously, somebody's programmed it. So in 1996, when I had the chance to kind of see a real relational system at the source code level, I'd already been involved with open source, I was like, Postgres, cool. It's like Informix, it's like Ingress, but I can see the optimizer, I can see the source code, and I can now start to look and see how does it do this magic? How does it actually figure out what to do? And how does it figure out how to get you the answer as quick as possible, okay? And that's why I've always been interested in it. Um, this is the other, that's, uh, those of you who've heard of Tom Lane, that's why he got interested in it. I remember the first time I talked to him, it was like a three hour phone call where we're walking through the optimizer source code trying to figure out why Postgres is so slow. And it's kind of cool. It's kind of really an interesting problem. And uh, Tom and I both had really boring uh, consultant jobs. So like you're doing financial reports for years and years. Like after a while, you're not learning anything. But Postgres, you're like, that's cool. Like I'm really learning some cool stuff. Um, and that it turned out to end up being a full-time job. But again, you don't know that at the time. So what does the optimizer do? It does three primary things. Again, its job is to look at your query and figure out how to get you the answer as quick as possible. Uh, and you might realize that to get you the answer as quick as possible, it's got to be adaptive. It has to know a whole bunch of different things because certain queries can be executed one way really fast, another way really slow. But if you use the same method for another query, it'll be really slow. So again, you have to kind of look at the query. You have to, there's some analysis that goes into it. And then the optimizer makes what it believes is the best decision. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how it makes that decision. It's got to make three decisions effectively for every query. <coughs> the first one is called a scan method. Again, these are terms we're going to talk about in a minute. Just kind of go with the flow. Uh, the second one is what we call a join method, and the third one is a join order. And those are the three kind of things the optimizer has to decide. Okay? So, first thing, scan method. What is a scan method? Well, a scan method effectively means how do I get my data? Um, I know you think of the first one, sequential scan, is like scanning straight from the front to the back. But we have other types of scan methods. We have the index scan method, and we have the super fantastic bitmap index scan, which I will explain to you. So uh, do not be dismayed. However, to get started, let's set up like a, a temporary table. So I'm actually going to run a whole bunch of queries here. They're all on the slides, but you're going to see the output of a whole bunch of queries. Um, so what I did was I took the PG class table, and I effectively uh, create sort of started to look and I've got some data from the PG class table. So this is the this is the first row eight rows of the PG class table. And what I did was I I changed my query and I chopped off just the I chopped off everything but the first letter. Hey. I was just talking about you. Sure. Yeah. Because I had some uh, I had lunch lunch with some people from Adobe and I said I said how is she doing? And they said good. <laughs> so um, they, we, I basically chopped off everything except the first letter, okay? Uh, so what I did was I basically decided I'm going to create a temporary table called sample, okay? And, and that temporary table, I'm going to chop off the first letter of the rel name column of the PG class table, and I'm going to hold, put a whole bunch of X's on the end of it, okay? So I'm just going to make like a dummy table, and I'm going to put an index on it right there. Okay, so that's my temporary table. That's the table I'm going to use for the, for the slides, probably the next five or seven slides. Okay? And if you think I'm making this up, you can actually download all of the SQL in this presentation. So if you want to just download that SQL file, you can run it, and you'll see exactly what's on this presentation. In fact, if you want to download this presentation, it's right here. So if you can barely spell Momgen, you will find that presentation. Uh, yeah, I've tried a whole bunch of different combos, and they pretty much all work. 
Um, so again, there is a presentation uh, tab there. Uh, there's probably 30 presentations on there, okay? But this one is one of them. And uh, uh, there's a lot of videos of them, too. So videos of me giving the presentations was kind of neat. So that's where you could find the SQL. So I'm also going to have a little helper function called lookup letter. Again, I needed that to kind of do some magic I needed to do. Um, so what does the table look like, this little sample table I've created? Uh, basically, I'm going to run a little statistics on it. I'm going to use a, a common table expression. And I'm going to query the, the letters from the table. And then I'm going to do a little statistical analysis on it. So this is actually what the, the sample table looks like. Uh, what you're going to notice is that 78% of the letter of the rows are the letter P. That's my most common value. And they kind of really go down from there. So for the S is only 3%, okay, 4%. The C is 3%. The R is 2%. Down here, 1%. Down here, like 1 point, 0.4. There's only one I and one K in the whole table. Okay, so I have, some, I have like 255 rows. I only have one I and one K. But I have a heck of a lot of P's because Postgres begins with a P. That's why we have so many of them. So let's take a look at what the optimizer decides to do when we ask for some data from this table. Very simple. We're going to start really simple. The ones at the end are going to be really hard, but we're going to start really simple. So let's say, let's start with the word explain, which allows me to see what the optimizer would, would want to do if it took this query. So I say explain. Uh, select letter from sample, uh, give me the letter P. And what I get out is something that says um, we're going to do a sequential scan. I'm like, okay, that's my most common letter, and you're doing a sequential scan. Then I do the letter D. Now, this letter is sort of middly. Maybe there's like four or five of them. And, you know, it's still doing an index scan. Look at that. And now I did the least common letter. I only have one of these. And what is it doing again? It's doing an index scan, right? Even though I told it, it should do something different. It, the optimizer here is looking very stupid to me. Because in fact, I've done the most common letter, and I've done the least common letter, and the optimizer has done the exact same thing in all the cases. Why is that? That is because we have no statistics on the table, OK? The statistic, the optimizer statistics, are stored in the database, and it allows the optimizer to more properly execute your query. If you don't have optimizer statistics, the system can't guess that the letter P is very common. It can't guess the letter K is very rare. So it ends up doing something stupid, which is what it was doing before. Okay. Now, there is an auto vacuum daemon that would normally have generated statistics. But in this case, because it's a temporary table, auto vacuum can't even see the temporary tables. Okay, so the big takeaway from this slide is that without optimizer statistics, don't expect a whole lot from the optimizer. Like, it's sort of like, I'll help you, but you've got to help me. Now, again, most tables are not temporary tables. Most tables will be auto vacuum automatically. As you add data to the table and delete data from the table, auto vacuum will keep those statistics updated. It'll, it'll go back, it'll say, oh, looks like some data's changed. Let's go reanalyze the table. But in this case, because it's a temporary table, I couldn't get statistics. Also, the auto vacuum only runs every minute. So if you create a table and run a query right away, the auto vacuum may not have gotten there to give you your statistics yet. So if you're doing some loading, some like major data loads, and then you want to run your query right away, you probably still want to run analyze on your, on your tables just to get the statistics and guarantee they're there when you start running your queries. Okay. So once I add statistics, I get something completely different. I now get, for the letter P, I get a sequential scan, which is exactly what I want. It effectively goes from the front of the table and goes all the way to the back of the table. Why does it do that? Because the letter P is 78% of my rows. It is not efficient for me to be bouncing all around the index to avoid seeing 22% of my rows. In fact, all that bouncing around the index is super expensive. So when I'm looking for a letter that's 78% of my rows, I'm going to do a sequential scan. In fact, I'm probably going to do a sequential scan for anything that's even probably more than like 6 or 8% of my table. I know that sounds really crazy, but the, the actual number where a, an index scan actually makes sense is a lot lower than you would guess. 
And if you don't believe me, I'll show you how you can kind of turn off sequential scan and force, and you can actually time it. But effectively, index is really expensive. Sequential scan is really fast, particularly because the kernel will do read ahead for all these rows. So it'll, it'll prefetch the rows as I'm going, because it knows I'm going in order, whereas random your index scan, you're random all over the place. When I do the letter D, this is the one where there's actually four of them, OK? Uh, and this is kind of in the middle. It's not the most popular value, and it's not the least popular value. So it does what we call a bitmap index scan. A bitmap index scan is effectively, it goes through the index, and it uh, populates a bitmap. And then from the bitmap, it basically goes to the table. Now, this diagram is even more complicated. It shows you can actually use multiple indexes and join them together in a bitmap index scan. In this case, we're not using that. We're just using one index. But you get the idea. The idea is that you're creating a bitmap so you don't have to revisit the heap pages, the data pages, over and over again. You're like, OK, I know page 5 and page 7 are the two pages I have to look at. My bitmap tells me that. And I'm just going to go to page 5 once, and I'm just going to go to page 7 once. OK, so it's really designed to kind of aggregate your heap accesses to kind of keep them together. The letter K, already mentioned that. There's only one of them. Very rare, 0.4% of my rows are K. Um, and effectively do a standard index scan, because we're only looking for one row. No sense in creating a bitmap. It's just overhead we don't need. So there's a good example of how the optimizer is using the, uh, the, the popularity or the, the frequency of a letter to sort of auto-tune how it wants to get at the data. And this is part of the reason you're using SQL. This is part of a reason you want a relational database. Because in a database that doesn't have an optimizer, your application has to decide whether it should use an index. OK? And if you want to join table to data together, you've got to do it in your application. So all these things that normally in a non-relational system you'd have to do yourself, or, or get very slow performance here, you're having the optimizer do it for you. You're sort of pushing the problem up to the optimizer. And the optimizer is smart enough, the auto vacuum system is smart enough, that as your data, even if you could program your application to, to use an index when something's popular and not use an index when one isn't popular, your data changes. So then every time the data changes, you're going to have to redo your application because all of a sudden I've got a lot of customers in Alaska now I didn't have before. No. Pushing that, that logic, pushing that decision up to the optimizer makes your application much simpler, makes it much easier for you to sort of get up and running and get going. OK? So um, let's put that all together. Uh, what I did was I took the query that I had run up here, and I basically run it through a little uh, function. So I have, this is a common table expression. I run it through uh, a little uh, select here, and I also call my my, uh, my little uh, sort of function I defined earlier. And now I get like the explain plan for each of the letters. I know it's kind of tricky, but if you look at the SQL ladle, you'll kind of see how it works. Um, and if I chop off just the first uh, line of each one, I get this. And this is like really nice for me. Because what it shows me is it shows me the different types of access method, the different scan methods that are chosen based on the frequency of the actual letter that I've chosen. So all the items in red here are uh, sequential scan because they're popular, at least in terms of, in fact, it turns out seven rows out of 255, it wants to do a sequential scan. Much lower, probably, than you would have guessed. Uh, between five and three, it realizes I'm going to do the bitmap thing. I'm going to access the index, but I'm going to kind of aggregate everything into bitmap. And then two and one, it just says, let's just go to the bitmap. Let's go to the index directly. We're not going to do the bitmap thing. OK? So this is normally where I'd be asked for questions, but I um, know that you're remembering the questions so that when I finish, I'll be able to answer them. Um, because I am, again, I want to make sure I get through the slides. Uh, so let's, uh, let's try something else. Let's turn off sequential scan and bitmap index scan. And effectively, what I've done is I've told the optimizer, I do not want you to consider these options. And the only one that's left is index scan. So if I actually take the same query and I run it, I actually get this really kind of 
monotonic looking output because in fact for for my most com my least common value and my most common value I am now doing an index scan okay and take a look at the cost now the cost for the low values is the same about 8 but you're going to notice it increases to 12 to 15 to 19 and it tops out here at 39 so 39 is my very expensive case where for I think 178 rows, I'm going to go through the index for every single row. Okay? If I look at the original output, it goes from 8 to 11 to 12, only goes to 13. Okay? So basically a 3x difference between the optimizer, what the optimizer wants to do, and me forcing it only to do a sequential scan. All right? So having understood the sequential scan or the scan methods, let's look at uh, join methods. So uh, join method is effectively how do we take two relations or two tables and join them together. Okay. Uh, there's actually four ways we can do it. Nested loop, there's two types, hash join and merge join. So four different ones. And we're going to take a look at those um, from some sample queries. To do this I need to again create uh, two temporary tables. Um, I'm going to actually use the pgproc table for some of my data. And I'm going to create a table called sample 1. I'm going to create a table called sample 2. And I'm not going to put any indexes on it. And I'm going to go with no optimizer statistics just to get started here. OK? So um, effectively, sample 1 um, randomly ordered 256 rows. Sample 2, 260 rows. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to join sample 1 to sample 2. And I'm going to say where sample ID, sample 1 ID is 33. And what I get is something called a nested loop. Okay? A nested loop effectively says take every row and compare it to every other row. So take this row, compare it to all these rows here. Take this row, compare it to all these rows here. Can take this row, compare it to all those rows here. Okay? Um, sometimes this is good if the tables are small. If the tables are big, it's bad. Right? If there's a million rows on one side and a million rows in the other table, you're talking a trillion rows have to be compared. Right, because a million times a million is a trillion, I think. Um, so uh, again, good for small tables, but not very good for big tables. Uh, but we don't have any optimizer statistics. The system has no idea. So it's like, I'm just going to do a nested loop. Uh, and that's what the pseudocode looks like for that. Okay. Now, what if I ask for all of the rows greater than 33? That's a little different. The first one was equality. Now I'm looking for just greater than 33, OK? And here I do what's called a hash joint. So I basically take one of the tables, and I hash it, and then I do lookups into that table. And this is what it kind of looks like. I have an outer table. So I take the inner table, and I create a hash in memory, OK? And then I'm going to do lookups from the outer table and look up rows in the inner table, OK? Uh, this is actually a really, really popular uh, join method. You see this a lot. Not only in Postgres, but all relational systems. You see a lot of hash joint, because it's good for sort of a medium-sized table. Uh, assuming this fits in memory, it's actually very fast. OK? Uh, that's what the pseudocode looks like for that. Now, what if I do the join, and I don't have any where clause at all? So I'm just like, no where clause, just join this one big table to this other big table. System uh, falls back to what's called a merge join. And a merge join. What we do is we sort one of the tables, and we sort the other table. And once we've done that, we can do the join by kind of walking the two tables in unison. So I can say, does this match this? Yes. Does this match this? No. OK. So now I'm going to compare this to this row. I don't have to go back to the beginning because it's ordered. right? So that matches that. That matches that. Uh, that doesn't match. OK, so now when I go here, I don't have to start at the beginning. I can start here, and I can just continue on. Okay. Now, there is overhead of sorting, but works really well, particularly if I have a lot of big tables. Okay. And that's what the pseudocode looks like for that. So um, what if we switch the table order? What if we put sample 1, 2 first? Right? Instead of saying sample 1, sample 2, we say sample 2, sample 1. It doesn't matter. Uh, the system automatically uh, will, will figure out which one should be where. Uh, Postgres is not a rule-based optimizer, it's a cost-based optimizer. So well, the way you specify the query really doesn't have any effect. Now, let's, let's, 
Let's do something different. Let's give the optimizer statistics. Let's give it a, let's give it a fighting chance to do the right thing, right? Um, so we're going to analyze sample one. We're going to analyze sample two. So when I now run the same query that used to be a merge join, OK, now that query with no where clause becomes a hash join because it knows exactly how many rows it's going to get because it has statistics for it. Um, even if you do a right out of join, Postgres is able to actually do that join that way. It's kind of cool. Um, if you do a cross join, I don't know have you, have you, how many people have ever seen a cross join before. Yeah, it's like really kind of esoteric. It's basically compare, you know, join every row to every other row. Okay, it's like a Cartesian product, which we used to call it, right? So effectively, that has to be a nested loop because you're you're just saying. Everything, every row matches every other row, right? It has to be that. Um, let's add an index. Let's add two indexes. We're going to add two indexes on the two columns we're interested in. And now what used to be a nested loop with, um, and now this becomes a nested loop with an index scan, OK? Because again, what's cool about this is instead of having to compare this row to every other row on this other side, I can now use the index to tell me where those rows are. So I'm not having to do a scan of the entire in outer, uh, inner side here. I can just use the index to get there. So index scan with sequential scan, an index, a nested loop with a sequential scans are slow, but a nested loop with index scans, not always so slow. Because again, the index is helping you here. Um, what, about the, what about the text field? I'm not sure if you saw, but I created a text field earlier in this table just to like fill out the table so it had a good length. Um, and I ended up putting all X's in the table. So I just made all X's. But if I ask for all A's, does the system know that I'm asking for a value that probably doesn't exist? In fact, it does. Um, in fact, it's sort of humoring me. It's like, you know, the, the statistics tell me there's not a single row in there with an A, but I'm going to assume there's one row here, just, for the, just to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to assume there's one row, and again, it's assuming a nested loop because it doesn't expect to find any matches. Okay? If I do it with Xs, puh, everything's different, right? Because it knows there's a heck of a lot of Xs in there. So now I'm looking at the exact numbers, 260, uh, 2256 and so forth. It's, gonna, it's actually going to do this join because it knows, even though that's not an index column, it knows how many X's there are and how many A's there are and, in general. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about limit. Uh, the limit clause is uh, something that came from MySQL. So back years ago, it was added, particularly for web applications. Um, the limit clause is really nice if you're running a query and you only want a certain number of rows from output, like you only want 10 rows or one row. Um, a lot of people used to use cursors for that, but the cursor is not as good as limit because it, when you open a cursor, you're not telling the optimizer I only want 10 rows. You're like, open the cursor, and then you say fetch 10, and then you close it, right? But you're not really helping the optimizer. If you help the optimizer, optimizer will help you. So here, um, if I do this join with nowhere clause, I get a hash join, but you know, if I add a limit to it, it's like, oh, they don't want me to join the whole table to the other table. They just want one row out of this. So I'm going to just use a nested loop, and I'll use an index scan, and I'll get that, that, those results much faster than the hash join I was thinking of. Okay? In fact, if I say a limit 10, it's still trying to do this and use the index. If I say limit 100, it's like, OK, I give up. Like now, all right, I'm. I'm I'm not going to be able to help you anymore. Now you're talking too many rows. We're going to actually go back to the old system. OK? So what have we talked about? Um, I explained what the optimizer is for. I explained how it's used um, sort of as the smarts of the system to figure out how to do it. We created a whole bunch of temporary tables. We ran through a bunch of queries. And I showed you using the explain command and some, some sort of fancy queries sort of how the optimizer does what it does, how it gets the output it does, how it adjusts itself based on what kind of statistics it has, what type of indexes exist, and uh, also sort of how you limit the output if you, if you give us a limit clause. Uh, this is a very sort of basic introduction to the optimizer. There's a lot more there. Uh, but I just wanted to give you sort of a general feeling of exactly what that optimizer does and how it does it. Um, and again, uh, if you go back to your Postgres database and you type explain, 
in front of any query, now you will actually see exactly what the optimizer has chosen. So the good news is I've actually uh, finished uh, early. So I actually have five minutes for questions, which is excellent. So I am ready to take questions. And I have one in the back here. Right. So the question is, yeah, I, I, I always get this. Yes. So the question is, uh, and I guess it's fitting. It's the first question. So the question is, why you know, do, Postgres does not support optimizer hints. Why is that? Uh, are they going to be added? Um, so I'm going to give you a historical reason, and then we can figure out whether that's still valid. So the historical reason is because the optimizer that we inherited from Berkeley when I started in like '96 was pretty bad. Um, and it didn't have a lot of the heuristics that you're seeing here, or at least not as fully featured as it is now. So the philosophy of the, of the community was that because we're an open source community and we want to hear about problems from users, uh, the idea was that by have, uh, not having hints when the, when the queries broke, People told us in email exactly what the query was, and then we could usually get a patch to them within a day of fixing that. Okay, so on our part, it was kind of a pain because we, you know, oh, this query's slow, and we're like, oh, you know, we're running around and we're trying to figure out how to fix it. Um, so you you do that for 15 years, and gee, your your optimizer becomes pretty good. Um, in fact, I would say that our ability to work with users and improve queries and sort of get them fixes and improve the optimizer is far superior probably than any other database, uh, closed source particularly, because in a closed source database, the communication between the users and the developers is this huge tangled mess. And a lot of times you send a bug in and you get it fixed nine months later, but then it broke another thing. And after a while, you just stop upgrading because it's, you just, I'd rather have the bug I know than the bug I don't know. Okay, um, that is not obviously the case for Postgres. So we've we've benefited from getting all that feedback. Um, I think we're probably at the point where the optimizer is probably not going to improve significantly in the next couple of years, um, and we probably need to start looking at the case where people are like in a production and something has messed up. I think the real crux of where we want to go with optimizer hints is not necessarily hints the way the system has done it. But there's a whole bunch of cases. When, now that we get feedback regularly about problems, and we, we don't get that many anymore. So the good news is you probably don't need them very much. But we still, there are still cases. So the point is that we, there are a bunch of cases where your data is correlated between two columns, and the optimizer doesn't know that. Um, and there's a couple cases where you've got very asymptotic uh, data distributions, and the optimizer may not may only know the first hundred common, but there may be two hundred common. Okay, so there's a bunch of cases where we not necessarily to do it on the query level, but to do it at the data level. So all the queries who use that particular type of data will benefit from the information, the hints you're telling us about how that data is laid out and the popularity of the data. So I, I think. If you look at the to-do list, the idea of putting the hint inside each query, unfortunately, is all, so often abused by developers because it, it ends up sort of making the, 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 the software very brittle. And that's one of the reasons we've been avoiding it. But I think, um, I think the idea of getting more ability for users to tell us how their data is laid out is really the, where we want to go. Because when we look at all the people, problems people have with data and optimizer problems, they almost always come down to that piece. And the cool thing is you do that one place and you're done. Um, do I have a question? Time for another question? No. No? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, um, so the question is, um, what type of statistics to keep? 
it keeps um, a record of the 100 most common values and, and, a, and a histogram buckets of 100 like buckets, histogram buckets. Now you can increase that granularity, so you can increase it to 200 or 500 if you want. If you create your own data type, you can actually plug in your own um, sort of selectivity function, we call it. And that's how you would tell us how selective particular values are. Okay? So I am out of time. I, I am sorry for